All right, great, thanks. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you about a project that I did in 2012, so five years ago, uh, that was called the Queen West Project. I could probably start by telling you how the project or the idea for the project came about. Um, it was one of those project ideas that I had at four in the morning uh, that actually gave me insomnia. I sort of woke up, I had this idea, and then I couldn't get to sleep until I'd written the idea down. And that's happened to me very infrequently in my life. I think that's happened twice. The other time that it happened, I had the idea for Forest Fringe, which is, uh, some of you might know, a sort of Edinburgh venue that we've been running for several years. So I know to kind of pay attention when I have these weird insomnia ideas. And this particular idea came from the fact that I'd lived in Toronto up until 2005, and I had worked on a street called Queen West. Queen West was a very rapidly gentrifying street at the time. It was kind of, think of Shoreditch maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and if you want to know where Queen West is now, think of Shoreditch now, basically. Uh, and when I was working there, uh, I was working at a video store, and across the street from the video store was CAMH, which is the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. This is a picture of CAMH as it was, I don't know, 100, 100 odd years ago, probably longer than that. It's the oldest mental health facility in Toronto. Uh, but there's something really frightening and problematic about the oldest mental health facility in Toronto, because as you can see from this photograph, I think that I have another picture here. These, these are actually called the Lunatic Asylum, Toronto. So back when CAMH was first created, it wasn't the most um, healing of places, I guess. And something that happened in the late 1990s was that there was a conservative government in Ontario and they cut a lot of beds in CAMH. So a lot of people with pretty severe mental health problems now didn't have anywhere to stay. And so Queen West had become a neighborhood where there was this center for addiction and mental health and there were a lot of homeless people with mental health problems. But there were also a lot of condo developers, a lot of places where you could get a latte, uh, and a lot of people with interesting haircuts. Uh, and the kind of confluence of those things was often really uncomfortable, really, for lack of a better word. So I thought, when I woke up at four in the morning, wouldn't it be interesting to make an immersive dance piece in Queen West where audience members were walking through the streets of Queen West and listening to headphones and then music would start to play and someone would start dancing to this music that only they could hear on the headphones. I didn't know anything about headphone-based theater at the time or walking-based theater. I, didn't, I was really just writing plays. I didn't really know much about you know, participatory theater in general, but I knew that that was an idea that was gonna stick with me until someone would give me the money to do it, which didn't happen until about five years later. Um, to give you a little bit of context about Queen West, or this particular mental health facility, you can see this is the wall that surrounded the site, and there's a wall today. Uh, this wall was built by patients 100 years ago as therapy, so, um, as therapy, they literally walled themselves in. <laughs> and the wall is still there today. But CAMH had become really interested in destigmatizing mental health in general and trying to find a way that this particular part of Queen West wouldn't be seen as a kind of taboo part of this very gentrified neighborhood. Um, this conveniently ended up happening around ex exactly around the time that I had thought of making this project or that I'd gotten the funding and the money together to make the project. Uh, this is a picture of someone who is homeless on Queen West. This was Queen West in the 1980s. Uh, it was a very different, you can see there's an adult video store there. It was a very, very different neighborhood. Uh, and this is Queen West today. So uh, you can see that there's quite, been quite a change there. This was the design that CAMH had for the new Queen West, or for the new um, CAMH. They wanted it to look as much like a series of new builds or condos as possible, um, which you can kind of take in whichever way you want to. That's just, that's just the facts. That's the way that they had planned it. And uh, this, is all, this is an amazing piece of graffiti that is right next to the park where the mental health facility is. So, 
that's also a, a homeless person next to a Starbucks on Queen West. So you can sort of see uh, what kind of neighborhood it, it is at the moment. So when I was thinking through making this project, I knew it was really important to me, but I had uh, a friend who, talking to me about the project, made a really great point. He said, he basically just said, you have to read Pedagogy of the Oppressed, because you're talking about making a project about mental health, about homelessness, and you are not a homeless person. You're not a person who has lived in this particular mental health facility. I mean, at the time, I was just thinking about getting dancers and a choreographer. I wasn't thinking, actually, do I have a, a right to try to make this project, to try to tell this story? So I read Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, how many people in the room have read P Pedagogy of the Oppressed or sort of know it? So yeah, like around half. Um, so for those who don't know, basically, Paula Friel's main argument is that oppressed groups can't be liberated by someone else. They need to liberate themselves. And if you are outside of that oppressed group, the best thing you can do really is be an ally, support that oppressed group to liberate themselves. But if you try to liberate them, actually you're just reinforcing the same power dynamics that have kept them oppressed in the first place. So suddenly I was thinking, okay, well how, how am I gonna make this project that I feel is really important? Um, when I am not someone who's homeless, and so much of this piece has to do with homelessness. Uh, one of the things that I did was I worked with a youth center called Avis Phoenix, and I worked in consultation with them on the script and on the project. We spent a lot of time walking up and down Queen West, listening to music on headphones, talking about what we could see, what we were thinking, uh, and we also worked closely with someone who had lived at CAMH in the 1990s. She was a schizophrenic, and she'd been an inpatient there for several years. That was helpful, but still there was something to me that didn't feel quite right. Uh, and I had a bit of a breakthrough when I was talking to a friend who had made a project about disability. And he'd said that uh, he'd been working with a paraplegic woman on the project who was sort of an intellectual, really amazing woman named Judith Snow. You should look her up if you don't know her already. She passed away a couple of years ago. But something that Judith taught him while he was working on the project was that disability is a little bit different, or being differently abled is a little bit different than um, trying to make work about a different culture, for example, uh, or about uh, gender politics or something that you really can't, can't actually access because you weren't born into that particular situation. Because what Judith said is that a lot of people actually really deliberately seek to distance themselves from disability because they are afraid that one day they could be disabled. Because we're not, you know, if you, if you were into, in an accident, it could happen. It could happen to you tomorrow. That's just a fact. And when I heard that, I thought about mental health, and I realized that I was spending all of this time in terms of the mental health element of the project worrying that I was coming at it from the outside, when actually I was coming at it from the inside more than I wanted to admit. And so I realized that the only way that I could really make this project was to be very honest in the piece about my own issues with mental health and my own experiences with mental health. Um, and so the piece became both about uh, homelessness and gentrification, but also about the ways that we try to distance ourselves from mental health and that we stigmatize mental health both in ourselves and others. So uh, we ended up making the piece. This is one of the dancers. He's wearing headphones in his solo piece. And that's the headphone. I should probably explain, well, I'm gonna show you a video to explain the actual form of the piece. Is it, it's hooked up to sound? Hi, can you hear me? I'm in your right ear and your left ear. I'll be walking with you and talking with you. I think that's how I'm walking and I'd like to talk openly if you don't mind. Let's sit down for a second. Notice the ground beneath you. Take a minute and notice. How does it feel to sit here? Do you feel like you're watching? Do you feel like you're being watched? Do you feel like no one's watching at all? Look to your left. Do you see them?
Okay. Um, so just four. Okay, great. Uh, so to give you a bit of a sense of what happens in the piece, first of all, the audience are told it's a Queen West project. That's the name of the project. So it would be a little bit like if you went to a project knowing it was called the Shortage Project. And they know that there's going to be uh, a, a sort of audio element, but they don't really know much else. And they certainly haven't been told about CAMH. There's been no mention of the CAMH grounds. Uh, throughout the piece, the, it's, uh, each audience member is given their own map, and they walk on their own along Queen West, uh, listening to this um, thing that I've written, basically, about, uh, about homelessness, I suppose. They sit down on the ground, somebody walks past them, um, and they just take a moment to think about what it is to sit on the ground in a, in a city, how that changes the way people are looking at you. And then they keep walking and they get to the grounds of Cam H. And once they get to the grounds of Cam H, they see a dancer. And that's when music starts and the dancer begins dancing and, and basically leads them into the grounds of Cam H. Most of the people who, had, uh, who were audience members had spent a lot of time on Queen West, it's a very trendy neighborhood, but had actually never walked into the grounds of Cam H before. It's just not a neighborhood that people go into in Toronto. Um, and they would go into the grounds of Cam H and then there would be some information about the history and the context of that particular building, of that particular site. Uh, and then there would be some information and some, basically about me, about, the, about um, my own struggles with mental health. Uh, and then, at the end of the piece, all six audience members and all six dancers meet up in the patient's garden, and they take off their headphones. And actually, that's a really important part of the piece to me, at the end, when they take off their headphones, because there's something about the headphones that's allowed the audience members to be at a certain remove from what's happening, to basically place themselves in a sort of fictional space. Whereas when they take off their headphones, they have to actually own the fact that they're there, what it means to be there. Um, and really the whole piece was actually in a way, Cam H were really happy with it because in a way it was about reintroducing people to this site that they were sort of treating as a pariah, I guess, if they hadn't been there before. Uh, and also, I had a lot of people who got in touch with me who just were really glad that I was speaking openly as, from the perspective of like, the authoritative perspective of the artist about, about mental health because at the time not that many people were speaking about it. So, yeah, that's, that's the piece, basically. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, hello. So would you mind joining me over here? Yeah, not at all. Um, maybe we'll get a cushion. Make it comfy. Amazing. There you go. Great. OK, so we have um, 10 minutes for questions. So if you have something uh, ready to go, please fire away, yeah. Uh, who you are? Are you a singer? Because I didn't understand you're an artist, but what sort of artist are you? Yeah, uh, I am... Hello, oh, hello. <laughs> okay, so I'm... It's such a funny question when someone asks you what kind of artist you are. I'm, for lack of a better word, I'm an artist who works in performance. And Basically, the way I usually describe myself, I think of myself often as like a conceptual artist who works with performance or theater as a medium. This particular project was actually really frightening to me to have the idea for because I'm not a mover and I'm not a dancer and I'm not a choreographer. So I needed to find the right choreographer to uh, collaborate with because I knew that dance was gonna be a, re a really important element of the piece, but not something that I could make happen on my own, basically. Um, but I, yeah, I write plays, I, uh, I make relational pieces, I make intimate work. It's always something to do with the live situation, though, uh, with what it means to be present with another person in a given situation. Does that answer the question? Oh, what did I study? Yes, <laughs> very curious. <laughs> okay, so I studied, my undergraduate was uh, a double major between English literature and film studies. Uh -huh. um, my master's was in text and performance, um, and my PhD was in narrative in theater. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm wondering how you came to see this as being a dance piece as opposed to all sorts of other things it might have been. Why dance? 
Yeah, so, it, so actually what was so funny is that there's a quote. Oh, geez, whose quote is it? I want to say it's Nietzsche's quote, but I'm not sure. It is Nietzsche's yeah. quote. Yeah, there's a quote that I didn't know of at the time when I had the idea for the piece. And the quote is, uh, and those who were seen dancing were thought mad by those who could not hear the music. Um, and so I suppose, I, I think unconsciously that same idea came to me. There was something about the fact that there were different people on this street who were having vastly different experiences of this street based off of where they were in terms of their mental health, but also in terms of capitalism, in terms of all sorts of elements of their lives. And I, and I thought dance, the, the very intimate experience actually of hearing music and knowing that nobody can hear it but you and that dancer who's dancing to it when you're in a public space, somehow really felt like it embodied that to me. Did you encounter any problems from the institute itself trying to do this? We didn't encounter any problems from the institute, although I was terrified they were going to say no. I mean, there was, when we were first planning the project, we hadn't planned to go into the grounds of CAMH. And it was actually the choreographer who was like, I think it's really important that they be in the piece and a really central element of the piece. And once we realized that artistically it was so clear that it was the right, and politically it was so clear that it was the right choice, so we started planning the project around that, but we were like well into rehearsals and we didn't know if CAMH was going to say yes, and I was just so relieved that they did say yes. One thing that was a bit of a problem is that we couldn't, we don't have much documentation of the piece because we couldn't take photographs on the grounds of CAMH, there are, there are rules around that. Um, so we could have some archival footage like this, but we couldn't really make the documentation as much of a priority as we would have liked to, which is a shame because it was a very expensive project and a very, it was a very exciting opportunity to get to make it. It just happened because there was a Metcalf Foundation anniversary grant, and so I kind of knew it probably wouldn't happen again, and it wouldn't happen in the way that it happened again, so it was sad not to be able to document it properly. But the other thing that did happen was that occasionally dancers would, um, there would be problems with patients who were on the grounds. Uh, not pro well, so there was one patient who became very, very besotted with one of the dancers and basically followed her every time she did the performance. Um, and the, the staff at KMH were really, really good at handling that and keeping, keeping the dancer feeling safe and keeping the patient feeling, you know, feeling comfortable and it, all, it was all fine. But that was certainly a situation where we were like, thank God KMH have given us permission and they know because this is something that we really need their help. Handling. Yeah. So you you said something about stigmatization, yeah. And I would like uh, how how do you think this project works about like this stigmatization and like the prejudice and distancing ourselves from mental health? Um, Destigmatization of mental health. Well, I guess I didn't really go that much into the way that I into the way that I talk about my own issues with mental health because I think that in a way that sort of comes from the narrative of the piece. But one of the first things that happens in the piece is the audience member are walking along Queen West and they hear me talking about a time that I was walking along Queen West and a homeless man came up to me and kept telling me that he wanted to kill himself sort of over and over again. There's a huge incidence of mental health problems amongst homeless people in Toronto. It's like a very, it's, um, it's not so much about addiction and drugs, it really is often about, about mental health problems there. So at the time, I was sort of trying to talk to him, but I couldn't, I couldn't really help him. And eventually I just had to leave him and he, he swore at me and got really angry that I had done. Um, and then within the piece, at some point, sort of late in the piece, uh, when you're really far into the grounds of Cam H, I admit that I, that I had an experience with suicide myself as, like, uh, as a younger person. And it's sort of this thing where at the beginning, it feels like this guy's very, very distant and very, very far away. But by the end, I have to admit that actually his experience, there's something about it that I do understand. And I can't pretend that I like live on this ivory tower where I'm totally untouched by mental health problems. One thing that I kind of, I don't know, maybe it wasn't necessary to address it in the piece, but I think the same thing that I said about um, how, how any of us could end up in a situation where we're differently abled without you know, even though we aren't right now, or how you could end up in a situation where you have a severe mental health problem, even though you don't, maybe you're not suffering from one right now. You could also end up in a situation where you're homeless, even though you're not right now. All of those things are um, 
precarities that do, that do exist in our lives. And some people are more vulnerable to them than others, but they are possibilities for everyone to some degree. So, uh, how do you think this project works with these prejudices like against it? Or do you think it does? Well, so I think that the, I think that the action of having this like, intimate voice in your ear that's talking to you about, about these experiences, uh, and then having that voice actually in a kind of just like confessional and honest way once you're quite far into the grounds of the facility, let you know that they've also suffered from these things too. There's something about that very direct confession that's not anecdotal, it's like person to person and there is, there is quite a lot of intimacy in hearing someone talk in your ear. Um, there's something about that that made people feel, I think, when it worked well, that made people feel that it had opened up a space for them to be more vulnerable and honest about their own mental health problems. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I think in terms of the project that we're doing with uh, Body Brain Bingo and today especially, um, using the methodologies of, of labs and conversations and talks and performances and really experimenting with form so that people can talk about different stuff, one of the things that's come up is, um, is about creating a space where you can be quite disarmed mm. and feel you can address language and the personal experience in a way that is not going to come back to bite you or put people off of like working with you, but actually creating a space that you can own a number of experiences that um, help that. And so just one last question about your experience working with those who don't come from the same background as you, specifically in terms of the arts. Mm -hmm. So either the institution in a more official way or collaborators can you say something about the language you use, like the words, or, or explaining things, or articulating things that were very important for the project that took you kind of a lot of attention and effort? Yeah, it's funny because when I, like I, show, I showed you all Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, obviously, but that's probably not something that I would have talked to a lot of the collaborators or, about, or I may have done, but I would have tried not to use extremely academic language, even like the word oppressed is maybe a little bit alienating for some, for some people. Um, so I was very, I was aware of the fact that I had to do a lot of heavy duty thinking myself, but that I did need to be able to express it in as clear, concise, and um, I don't know, just, yeah, in as clear and concise a way as possible, and in a way that wouldn't make people feel shut out of the conversation. And that I also needed to be hearing other people's points of view, particularly when it came to working with the street youth from Avis Phoenix. People made ama like amazing, amazing points, uh, not in extremely academic language. Um, you know, they were teenagers. They were teenagers who were talking to me about how they had felt, you know, not having a home. And, uh, and I, I would just really do my best to, to listen and to take what they were telling me very seriously. Um, but it was a constant, you know, it's, I don't know that I have an answer for it because it was, a, it was a constant learning process. And I think particularly with, the, peop with the, the teenagers from Avis Phoenix, you just have situations where they wouldn't show up and that just happens. That's gonna happen if you're working with teenagers who are struggling with homelessness. You just have to accept that. You just have to kind of value the time that you have with them while they're spending time with you. Thanks so much for coming down uh, and for talking to us. I know you're really pressured for time today as well, but uh, I'd like to just say a massive thank you to Deborah for contributing today. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, Deborah's on Twitter, and there are all sorts of things you can continue to, uh, to engage with, even though you're not able to stay with us for the rest of the day, which is a shame, but thank you. Um, Claire. Um, so now we have Claire Coleman uh, talking about her project. And uh, again, we'll be followed by a short Q&A session before we move on to the next um, session. 